delicious. This is a rum runner, but not the kind of rum runner we're talking about today. No, we're talking about some of the best prohibition rum runners who smuggled rum and other liquors into a small town in Florida known as Conktown. They were called conks because at some point in history, Bahamian fisher folk called themselves that after a marine gastropod mollusk. It was a popular food resource in the Caribbean. In the early 20th century, about 75 of these Bahamian conch families migrated to East Florida and started what became locally referred to as conch town. The development and growth in South Florida, particularly Flagler's railroads, attracted Bahamians who were interested in paying jobs. Their primary source of income and trade was fishing. It was very popular in Riviera in the early 20th century. We met up with Chipper Griffin, whose grandfather, Berlin Griffin, was a fisherman who came over with his family in the early 1900s. The conks uh, go back to 1647, and they ended up being shipwrecked off of uh, Spanish wells in Eleuthera, and they came ashore and they settled there. They eventually got over to New Providence around 1792. So Riviera Beach at that time, the, the conch community, conch town as it's known, was not very big. It was only several hundred people. They would fish half the year over here and fish half the year over there. The conchs lived in temporary structures. It was described as straight wood and tin roofs. According to modern standards, it wasn't a pleasant, town or a attractive area to live, but it was sustained by their commercial fishing. There's only so many fish. So yes, they got crafty, but it was a hard scrabble life. So you were either a fisherman or you sold things for tourists. They were a highly skilled artistic group of people. Women and children would weave palmetto into hats, rugs, and purses that they would sell to tourists. They would also make beautiful crafts from shells, but that, in addition to the income from fishing, was still barely enough. These incredible photos were taken by Charles Foster, documenting Kongtown life for the WPA in the 1930s. It shows a resilient, yet charming community that made the very best of their situation. If only there was a way to make better use of the conch's skill set as profound watermen. Prohibition opened a new source of income for the conch community. Ah, the good old Volstead Act of 1919. This new law prohibited the sale and consumption of alcohol in the United States. Wait. Palm Beach County was booming in the 1920s. You have so many hotels and resorts um, being built all over. I would say that there was a robust interest and desire for liquor consumption because of the amount of people and tourists that were attracted to these resorts and hotels. With the Bahamas only 60 miles away, the conks not only had the connections, but the right skill set for the job. The conks were familiar not only with the South Florida waterways, but the Bahamian waterways as well. They knew what, where all the inlets were. They used to come in here and settle and fish. So they, they knew where to hide, certainly. They knew it better than, than, than the police did. It all came down to supply and demand. The supply was in the Bahamas and the demand was back in the US. A typical boatload was about 300 sacks of whiskey, gin, or rum. There were six quarts in each sack, or ham as they were called, because when they were stacked up, they were in a pyramid shape. Back in the Bahamas, a ham would only cost 12 to $14. But once it hit the shoreline in Palm Beach, its value shot up to $120. On the other hand, the going rate for Florida Grouper in 1925 was anywhere between 20 and 30 cents a pound. I'll let you do the math. And one of the conks who took advantage of this was Chip's grandfather, Berlin. And so he was a king fisherman and he went out with a fleet. So they used to go out with a fleet and then the fleet would catch their fish. Well, he'd go over to the Bahamas and he'd load up with liquor and he'd come in with the fleet and it looked like they were loaded just like the other boats with fish. According to Foster, here was a group of experienced seamen with a lot of small boats located on an ocean shore with plenty of obscure inlets and coves. It was a perfect setup for rum running. 
they could make a round trip in under three hours. As far as the vessels, they went from their fishing vessels, which they caught on to, to they had vessels they'd run at night that were long. I'd say they were 40, 50 feet long. And they'd cover them in canvas so all the waves could come over them and all you could see was one guy's head sticking up. There was a huge economic advantage for anyone running rum from the Bahamas and then selling it back in the United States. One eyewitness from Riviera at the time named Paul Aubrey described the process in his book, The Story of the Bahamas. The smugglers developed a remarkably efficient organization. A signal from a flashlight would indicate whether the coast was clear to boats offshore. If revenue officers were about, the craft quickly moved on to a second or third rendezvous point. Aubrey goes on in detail about a shore party forming a human chain to unload the sacks from the stern of the boat into a waiting van. They could unload a boat in under 20 minutes. They would have used mangrove islands like here and, and they would either stash and, and US-1 is right up there and they would come up and they would run it up to the road and put it in their cars and run it back down to West Palm Beach to a safe house and they would go really fast into the safe house, close the doors and all hang out and look like nothing was happening. From the safe houses, they would distribute to speakeasies all over Palm Beach, West Palm Beach and beyond. Without the booze, I'm not so sure the 20s would have been quite as roaring. And the Rum Runners had a good time too. Berlin was only in his 20s during Prohibition, so he and his brothers, who'd soon join him, saw bootlegging as a game of cat and mouse. My grandfather didn't work for organized crime. It wasn't organized crime like it was up in New York. He was a fisherman and happened to be in the right place at the right time with the right relatives in the right positions in the Bahamas at the right year. Not a lot of them got caught, so there's not a lot of information. There aren't a lot of records on the conks running rum in the 1920s. There is no police records or newspaper articles. Almost all of the conch rum runners got away with smuggling countless bottles of liquor into Florida. My grandfather built quite a business and saved up quite a bit of money. Now when Prohibition was over, he took all that money and he bought all the liquor licenses in Palm Beach County that he could buy, which at the time my uncle tells me was 40 liquor licenses. Charles Foster wrote, the conchs of Riviera had gone from a camp of seasonal migrant workers to owning their own boats, homes, and businesses. The money they made from rum running helped them turn a small fishing village into a community that built churches, schools, and a post office. After Prohibition, Berlin not only went on to own many liquor licenses, but became a prominent businessman in Palm Beach County, opening several restaurants, the Riviera Theater, and even the Palm Beach Kennel Club. And he wasn't the only conch rum runner who went on to do big things. Roland Simonette moved to Riviera Beach in 1915 and would become one of the most successful bootleggers of all. He would later turn to political office in the Bahamas and after they declared independence, Roland would become the very first premier of the country and then go on to serve as a Senator for over 50 years. To this day, he's recognized as a national hero and his face is even on the Bahamian $50 bill. Name another rum runner who can top that. Go on, I'll wait. When I think of Charles Foster's images of Conktown, USA, I always think about the little boy who fell asleep on top of the fishing nets in the boathouse. <laughs> 